together for our Wednesday night Bible study where we are talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We want to welcome all those who are joining us on Facebook Live as well as uh, uh, by telephone on pre-conference call. And uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, again, this uh, Friday night, uh, 7 o'clock, we have our prayer where we are uh, looking at uh, how to pray effectively for reaching lost loved ones. And uh, we enjoy, uh, invite you to join us for that. Uh, also on uh, Sunday at 9.30 a.m., uh, we'll be having our online church service. And uh, we are looking to reopen on uh, May 31st, which is Pentecost Sunday. And uh, we are planning to uh, have our service here at the church. Everything uh, continues to move along with the uh, uh, opening of everything. And uh, we'll just be taking precautions, doing things a little bit differently as far as social distancing, wearing masks, and uh, also ask if anybody is sick, that they remain home. And uh, uh, we'll just uh, move on from there so we can start getting back into uh, fellowship and uh, doing what we're called to do. Uh, before we pray this evening, I uh, just want to uh, remind us for those that uh, need, continue to need prayer, uh, uh, Linda, uh, who had knee surgery, is going to have a, a recovery process, want to continue to lift her up. Uh, Pat, whom we have been praying for, uh, is doing much better. Uh, she had actually uh, gotten to the point where they brought in hospice, and uh, now she seems to be uh, eating and drinking uh, on her own, and uh, uh, so we praise God for that. I uh, also want to continue to pray for Jackie, who is uh, recovering from a, a serious fall. Uh, Jill, uh, who is going to be getting more tests uh, on her heart. And also uh, Debbie. And uh, did she end up having surgery, do we know? Or did Debbie have surgery? Uh, yes, Debbie is home. She's back home. She's back home today. Okay, amen. Well, we praise God for that too then. Amen. Well, let's have a word of prayer before we get into the word tonight. Father, we just want to thank you tonight as we gather together in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for your spirit that you send to be with us, to teach us, to lead us and guide us into all the truth, to open the word to our understanding. As we continue to study the gifts of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we pray for your uh, uh, wisdom and revelation that we can uh, understand these gifts better. We can identify the gifts that you have given to each one of us. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for those that uh, you have been touching and uh, uh, the good reports we've been receiving on uh, numbers of those we've been praying for. And we also continue to lift up those that are going through recovery process. Uh, Lord, that you continue to be with them and their families. And uh, Lord, that you continue to just touch their bodies to bring healing and complete restoration and uh, raise them up back to the uh, condition of good health. And we thank you that you are our healer and our provider as we continue to face the challenges uh, with this virus. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to meet all of our needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus as you open your hands unto all of your creatures and uh, provide those things, Lord, uh, that we need to uh, uh, survive and uh, and get through this season. We thank you, Father, for your presence and power here with us tonight. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come and direct all things according to the will and purpose of the Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Praise God. Well, we are uh, down to some of the final gifts uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 12. Uh, we began uh, last week with the, uh, what we call the fivefold ministry gifts. And uh, he tells what to each one of us grace was giving according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first 
descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So as we look at these uh, fivefold ministry gifts, we recognize that these are a little bit different from uh, the other gifts of the Holy Spirit that we've been looking at, and that these gifts are actually the people that are given uh, to the church and are anointed with special ministries, and as we see, uh, these are leadership-type ministries for the perfecting of the saints, for bringing spiritual maturity to the body of Christ, for uh, overseeing things in the church and judging the things that take place and uh, protecting uh, the saints from false doctrines and false teachers and uh, various things along this area. So last week we looked at the, uh, the apostle. So tonight I want to begin by looking at the uh, ministry gift of the prophet. And uh, the prophet is, is listed second in this uh, list uh, next to the apostle. And uh, again, it's important for us to recognize that in the kingdom of God, we are all uh, equals uh, in Christ as priests of God. We are all called to be the priests of God. Uh, what separates us uh, in this area has to do with our functions in the body of Christ. God gives us different gifts and different functions uh, in order to uh, provide all of the necessary resources, again, for the building up of the body of Christ, for the perfecting of the saints, and bringing about spiritual growth, and uh, uh, making sure that the church operates and functions the way it needs to. Now, prophecy uh, can come forth as either foretelling or predict, uh, predicting future events, uh, or foretelling, which is speaking basically what God is saying to his church now. So uh, the prophet not only exercised the gift of prophecy, but he also took a place of authority and leadership with the apostles and teachers. Now the early church had two classes of prophets. Uh, in the sense that, uh, as we looked before in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit was prophecy. And so, uh, in actuality, any member of the uh, body uh, can operate in the gift of prophecy as the Holy Spirit moves. In other words, the, those, those nine gifts of the Spirit in Corinthians, he tells us, are uh, brought forth as the Holy Spirit uh, wills. Uh, he can use anybody. In fact, the Bible tells us that we should all seek to prophesy uh, from that sense. And uh, again, as the Spirit moves and uh, moves upon different individuals. As we see in the Old Testament that the uh, Holy Spirit would come on uh, certain individuals and they would prophesy. But uh, uh, the difference here is that this office or this uh, function of prophet is actually a ministry. And uh, again, someone that has been anointed by God uh, to fulfill that function and ministry to the body of Christ. And uh, uh, normally, they would minister in the area of edification, exhortation, and comfort through the gift of prophecy. Uh, as we look through the New Testament, we'll find that certain individuals such as uh, uh, Barnabas, Silas, Judas, and Agabus, who were spiritual leaders of the church, uh, were also called prophets and were a ministry gift to the body of Christ. So you'll find that numbers of people in the New Testament were identified uh, as prophets, not just being used for, uh, uh, you know, once in a while uh, where the Spirit would move upon them to prophesy, but walking in that function of a prophet. In Acts chapter 2, verse 16 through 18, when uh, talking about uh, uh, Peter was explaining what was going on on the day of Pentecost to all of the multitudes that came running 
uh, when the Holy Spirit was poured out and uh, uh, Peter explained what was happening by uh, saying this was what was spoken by the prophet Joel and it shall come to pass in the last day says God that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh your sons and daughters shall prophesy your young men shall see visions your old men shall dream dreams and on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy so here we're looking at uh, the, 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 uh, one of the nine gifts of prophecy whereby the Holy Spirit can move upon anybody to prophesy. And as we read through, again, the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts, uh, not only did multitudes prophesy on the day of Pentecost, but other instances where uh, people got saved and were filled with the Holy Spirit uh, one of the evidences that came forth was those who were filled with the Spirit began to prophesy. And again, it wasn't uh, so much of uh, foretelling something to come. It wasn't a predictive type of prophecy, but they were proclaiming what God was speaking through them. Uh, in fact, a lot of instances when they talked about them prophesying, they were declaring uh, God's uh, who God was and, and uh uh, declaring uh, his, his worship and His praise and uh, just speaking the things that God was uh, ministering through them. Because remember, especially on the day of Pentecost, they were actually speaking in known languages of those people that were present at that time. And so they were speaking to them the glories of God. And uh, uh, so that that was the more to do with the... Uh, uh, the uh, nine, uh, nine gifts of, the, of uh, uh, the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 19, verse 6, he says, When Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So here again, that has to do with those uh, gifts. Now, the New Testament lists uh, numerous people gifted as prophets, uh, beginning really with John the Baptist. John the Baptist in uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 76, uh, when uh, his father began to prophesy at the birth of John the Baptist, and he said, You, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. So John the Baptist was uh, uh, given this gift of a prophet. He had the office, the function of a prophet, and specifically... He was the prophet of Jesus Christ. He was his forerunner. And Jesus, went, or, or John the Baptist, went forth uh, before uh, Jesus, proclaiming that he was the Christ, he was the Messiah, he was the one that was promised by God. And so uh, you can see here in this sense that John the Baptist wasn't prophesying predictably, in other words, telling the future events, he was proclaiming what God was doing right then and there, that God had sent the promised Messiah, that Jesus was the one whom he had sent to bring salvation, deliverance of the people. So he was uh, therefore uh, uh, foretelling what God was revealing to the people in that present time. Okay, So uh, he was a good example. In Acts chapter 13, verse 1, he said in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, uh, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, who we know as Paul. Paul was also uh, known as a prophet as well as an apostle. He also, he tells, he had the gift of teaching, okay? So uh, again, you'll see that those in these leadership positions many times had uh, more than one gift. And uh, uh, almost out of necessity, they all had to have the gift of teaching because that was one of the primary functions of this fivefold ministry, uh, the, the edifying of the, of the body of Christ. You have to be able to teach. And when he lists the qualifications uh, for bishops, the overseers in the church, which is the leadership, they all 
were, uh, when, when it was necessary that they all had this gift to be able to teach because that goes with a gift of leadership. In Acts chapter 15, verse 32, he says, Now Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. So here we can see that one of the functions of the prophet is to exhort people, to, to strengthen them in the faith, to, uh, again, speaking uh, edification to the church in a way uh, that will keep them moving in the direction uh, that God wanted them to go. We have to remember that in those days, the church was going through a lot of tribulation, uh, a lot of persecution. Uh, there were a lot of attacks against the church in those days from both the, uh, the Jewish uh, people that refused to accept Christ as well as the Romans. And so uh, uh, the saints were really being tested in their faith. So one of the uh, purposes of this prophetic ministry was they would go from church to church and they would go to strengthen the saints and to encourage them, to exhort them to continue in the things of God. And, uh, uh, and, and, and again, uh, the, the foretelling was also uh, a part of that uh, because, again, you'll find that throughout the New Testament we are given prophecies concerning the coming again of Christ. And the, uh, well, the whole, uh, pretty much the whole book of Revelation uh, was uh, given by John is a, a prophetic uh, word concerning all the things that are to come in the last days. So you can see where they've been used on both, uh, in both ways. In uh, Acts chapter 21, verse 9 through 11, as Paul was on his way uh, to Jerusalem, he says, this man, he had stopped, uh, this man had four, uh, four virgin daughters who prophesied. Now this is interesting when you read this passage because you'll actually see uh, both of these giftings. You'll see the, one of the, the, the uh, uh, first Corinthians chapter 12 gift of prophecy and also the function or office of a prophet. He says, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind this man, uh, who, the man who owns this belt, and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So here we can see that this man's four daughters uh, were used by uh, the Holy Spirit to prophesy. But it seems to be telling us that they were not actually prophets in the sense of having that function. On the other hand, he specifically tells us that Agabus was a prophet. He had been anointed of God uh, and to, to uh, walk in that function uh, to the church. And here we can see that the Holy Spirit moved upon him to give a word to Paul of what was coming when he went to Jerusalem. So you can see we have examples of uh, how these uh, prophets operated throughout the New Testament. Now the gift of prophecy operates uh, in the following manner. Because again, we have to remember all of the gifts are gifts of the Holy Spirit. And part of that means that it is the Holy Spirit that energizes them, that brings them forth, that directs them, that uh, is giving the things that need to be done. Okay, so the prophet is basically an agent or representative of the Lord. He is there to speak what the Lord wants him to speak as uh, the Holy Spirit directs him. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7, he said, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou, thou, uh, command, uh, command thee, thou shalt speak. So Jeremiah, one of the uh, major prophets of the Old Testament, tells us that it was God who directed him in the things that he were to speak. In fact, he tells us in Jeremiah chapter 1 that God actually touched 
uh, his lips and put his word in his mouth uh, for him to speak to the people. And all through you'll find in the Old Testament all of those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit to speak words from God. In Jeremiah 1.8 it says, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So this holds true also for the New Testament. God is the one that must put the words in our mouths to speak because, again, the purpose of prophecy is to speak on behalf of God, not to tell people what we think, not to help tell people what we want to speak, but we are speaking as a representative of God, so he is the one that tells us what to speak. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, Peter uh, brings this out for the New Testament. He says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture uh, is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man. In other words, prophecy is not real prophecy if it's, if it's coming out of man, out of his understanding or out of his will. Okay? He says, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Again, reiterating that true prophecy is directed by the Spirit of God. Now, many times the prophet's message will be given extemporaneously at the time of speaking. But we also find many times in the Bible that it may also be given beforehand uh, uh, during prayer or meditation. In fact, we find that the book of Revelation was given to John beforehand and then was written out and given to the church. Many of the Old Testament prophets uh, received their messages and, and visions and dreams and, and during prayer times to be delivered to the people uh, later on. And so they would actually write out those prophecies. In fact, we have examples in the Old Testament, uh, particularly with Jeremiah, that he actually had a young man named Baruch that uh, would actually write down his prophecies as he gave them. And sometimes uh, he would even have his servant go and uh, share that word uh, with the uh, uh, people that it was meant for. Sometimes the message may be uh, scriptural truth or history known to the prophet, uh, such as we see with Peter proclaiming on the, the day of Pentecost, he quoted much of the Old Testament scripture. The Holy Spirit directs the use of scriptures and its application to specific situations. For instance, we find in the New Testament, many times, especially with Jesus, uh, talks about it is written, or they will quote directly from the Old Testament and tell us the application of that uh, scripture to the present time and how it was being fulfilled. Not all preaching is prophetic, but preaching becomes prophetic where great unpremeditated truth or application is provided by the Spirit or where we are given special revelation beforehand in prayer and it is empowered in its delivery. Before the New Testament was written, many of the apostolic prophets were used by the Holy Spirit to reveal the plan of salvation. The prophetic revelation later became incorporated into the epistles. Okay, you'll notice that the letters that were written uh, by the various writers of the New Testament, uh, uh, much of that was, was actually spoken before those things were ever written down and shared with the churches. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, uh, Paul tells us, Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So Paul is telling us that uh, the things that he was sharing and the things that the other apostles uh, were sharing uh, in those early days before all these things were written down 
were given uh, uh, from the Holy Spirit. These were things that in the Old Testament were hidden. They didn't really understand a lot of these things. Uh, they were prophesied things that would come, but they didn't understand them at the time. So now the Holy Spirit began to reveal these truths, uh, particularly concerning Christ and all these prophecies concerning this new covenant. And so uh, it was the apostles and prophets that were moved by the Holy Spirit who gave them the revelation. He gave them the understanding of these things so they could then proclaim them uh, to the church. And, uh, and from that, they were then written down for all of our benefits. Now, while, proph while prophecy is mostly foretelling rather than foretelling, it may still involve predictions of the future, as we see in the book of Acts uh, with Agabus and uh, other uh, scriptures in the book of Acts. Uh, prophecy may be given to reveal or confirm a coming event, uh, but uh, or also to provide personal guidance. Again, Paul was uh, prophesied to concerning uh, his coming arrest in Jerusalem, but at the same time, Paul still had to follow his understanding of God's will for his future. The righteous are to walk by faith, living one day at a time, leaving the future to God. We are never to seek prophetic guidance for the future uh, in, in the sense of wanting, you know, we have many people that run around just wanting the word, wanting the word, and that's a dangerous thing to do uh, because, again, there's many false prophets, as the Bible tells us, and it can lead to, really, witchcraft. And so we should always be careful uh, when it comes to prophecy. It must be tested by the Word of God, uh, by leadership, and uh, uh, we need to be protected uh, uh, from that false messages. Uh, we'll also find in times where God revealed uh, that there was a famine uh, coming to Jerusalem. And because of that prophetic word, uh, Paul and others began to go around raising funds uh, to help the brothers and sisters in Christ that were in Jerusalem. And in uh, fact, the giving sections in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 9 and 10 uh, was all about that. The, it was about raising the monies, uh, collecting these funds to send to those people that would be uh, in need in Jerusalem uh, so that they would have the necessary uh, resources during that famine. So, uh, uh, again, prophecy has a lot of different uh, uses uh, throughout the Scriptures. Now, when someone exercises the gift of prophecy, he speaks as the Spirit supplies the thoughts and reveals the message. God does not actually speak, but rather tells the prophet what he wants to say. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29, he says, Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. So again, God uh, wants to have order in the church in all things. And this is one area, again, uh, because both in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, uh, one of the biggest rebukes we find that God gives over and over again to the church was false prophets. And uh, he talks about prophets that divine for money, uh, prophets that uh, speak out of their own hearts rather than uh, being in the presence of God and listening for what God wants to reveal through them. And uh, Jesus, in fact, almost every single writer in the New Testament warned us that uh, as we got into the latter days, uh, before the coming of Christ, that there will be many false prophets throughout the earth uh, deceiving people and uh, trying to draw them away from God. So, again, God gives us people in the church that have the responsibility to judge uh, these things that come forth in the body of Christ. And uh, uh, Paul tells us in the uh, book of Acts chapter 20, when he brought the elders to himself to speak to them as he was on his way to Jerusalem, and he told the elders that they had the responsibility to judge the things that came forth. So it seems, uh, since the message must be judged, it seems more humble to speak from the third person uh, rather than the first person, such as I 
the Lord say, uh, but again, uh, even in the New Testament, we find that uh, people boldly declared, thus says the Holy Spirit, or God was revealing these things. Uh, in the uh, Didash, which we've talked about before, which is a very old document, uh, back in the uh, early church, and uh, it basically deals with uh, some of the uh, admonitions to the church and uh, uh, the various ways the church function. And it's interesting that all the way back then, uh, they had a section in there concerning the apostles and prophets of the day. And he says that concerning the apostles and prophets, so do ye according to the ordinance of the gospel. Let every apostle, when he cometh to you, be received as the Lord, but he shall not abide more than a single day, or if there need be, a seven. But if he abide three days, he is a false prophet. And when he departeth, let the apostle receive nothing save bread until he findeth shelter. But if, if he asks money, he is a false prophet. So you can see, even in the early church, they were already having issues uh, with these false apostles and prophets getting into the church and, and it seems to be again one of the problems that we find out through all the Bible is it was centered around money. He says any prophet speaking in the spirit you shall not try neither discern for every sin shall be forgiven but this sin shall not be forgiven. Uh, again talking about this uh, falsity where they are prophesying for money. And yet even today we find the same thing going on. You'll find that there are a lot of ministries around, a lot of ministers that proclaim themselves to be prophets, but if you want a word, you have to send them uh, money, usually quite a bit, uh, to get a special word uh, for you. He goes on to say, yet not everyone that speaketh in the Spirit is a prophet, but only if he have the ways of the Lord. So here he's telling us that a prophet in the early church uh, needed to show forth the fruits of righteousness, that they walked in the ways of Jesus Christ, that they were uh, upright uh, individuals that were uh, holy and, and walking uh, in the Spirit of God. He says, from his ways, therefore, the false prophet and the prophet shall be recognized. That comes directly from the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7. He tells us that uh, we shall know the prophets by their fruits. In other words, by their character, by the way that they act. He says, and no prophet, when he orders a table in the spirit, shall eat of it. Otherwise, he is a false prophet. And every prophet teaching the truth if he doeth not what he teaches, is a false prophet. Again, talking about, well, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna preach it, you need to live the example of it. If you're not gonna do what you say, then you're a false prophet. And again, this comes from uh, what Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, and also in Matthew chapter 23, when he was dealing with the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees, uh, this is what Jesus was dealing with them about. That they said one thing, they, co they commanded the people to do one thing, but they lived a different way. They didn't do what they taught. He says, every prophet approved and found true, if he doeth aught as an outward, mystical, typical of the church, and yet teaches you not to do all that he himself doeth, shall not be judged before you. He has his judgment in the presence of God. For in like manner also did the prophets of old time. Again, comparing the issues uh, with the Old Testament prophets where God rebuked them in the Old Testament. And whosoever shall say in the Spirit, give me silver or anything else, you shall not listen to him. But if he tell you to give on behalf of others that are in want, let no man judge him. So here it comes down to is, Again, you're not to prophesy for money, but if the Lord is moving you to help others, then 
it is acceptable to ask people to give in that sense. And again, you can kind of see the uh, when the uh, prophet prophesied about the famine, uh, the purpose of it was that the church would respond and help those people in need. So you can see in a sense that it was used in that way. So it's just interesting that even in a very early church uh, that they established a system uh, to uh, uh, make sure that things were done decently and in order and that uh, things were being judged and uh, were coming forth the way they should. We must always remember that all prophecy, the number way we judge it is it must agree with the Word of God. Because again, the same God that uh, gives us the prophecy is the same God that gave us the Word. So they cannot be in disagreement. Now the gift of the prophet is the one gift, uh, again, which comes with many warnings we would do well to heed as we are living in the days of fulfillment of these things. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, John tells us, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So John again reminds us that we need to test the spirits. Is this the Holy Spirit that is speaking to us, or is this another spirit that we need to be aware of? Because as Paul talks about, uh, tells, uh, talks about uh, uh, being another Jesus, another gospel, and another spirit, we're already getting to the church in the days of Paul. Now Jesus himself, and again nearly every writer of the New Testament, gives us warnings about false prophets within the church seeking to deceive people. And along with us, uh, we find the same warnings throughout the Old Testament because this has been a prophet or a problem uh, throughout the entire Bible. Amen. Um, I'm going to, to uh, cut this off here, and uh, I think that next week we will finish uh, these uh, gifts and. Uh, We'll be getting into another area after that. So um, uh, these two, the apostle and prophet, are the primary uh, ones as far as their function uh, in this leadership. The other three, as we look at them, we'll see, uh, because again, the, the apostle and prophets were responsible for laying down the foundation uh, uh, for the gospel, for the uh, church, uh, they're the ones that uh, uh, took the lead in most situations, and uh, uh, again, they all still work together uh, because God gave me five minutes, fivefold ministry to function, and each one is necessary to do everything uh, to make the church complete. So uh, uh, we'll look at those other three next week and finish this up. But uh, again. We want to remind everybody that uh, this Friday at 7 o'clock uh, Eastern Time will be on for prayer where we are learning how to pray for lost loved ones so that we can help facilitate uh, getting them to the Lord. And then Sunday morning we'll be online at 9.30 to uh, have our regular Sunday service. And then Pentecost Sunday, uh, May 31st, we will be re uh, returning to church uh, and reopening the church for our Sunday morning service. And uh, we will also be doing it online for those uh, that are not ready to return or cannot uh, come to church. You'll still be able to uh, join with us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close tonight. Father, again, we want to thank you uh, for your Holy Spirit and the gifts that you have given to your church that we might uh, have, be able to see the church built up in love, that it might be edified, that spiritual growth would come, that your saints would be perfected, that we would all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, that we all would be built up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that, Lord, your people would no longer be children, but we would grow up spiritually into our head, Jesus Christ, 
So, Father, we thank you for the fivefold gifts that you've given to us for this purpose. We pray, O oh God, that you will uh, uh, teach us the ways of these gifts, that you would reveal to those, Lord, that you have called uh, to these various functions in the body of Christ. Lord, we ask that you would add these to all of your churches, O oh God, so that the churches can function the way that you have ordained them and to do the things that need to be done because we need all of the gifts to operate uh, to have that completeness. Father, we thank you as we go out of this place that you continue to be with us, to watch over us and protect us. We thank you for your angels that you have given charge over us, that, Lord, as we reside in the, in, in the place of your refuge, as we uh, remain under the shadow of the Almighty, that you protect us from this virus and from all the attacks of the enemy, that you keep us in your grace and mercy and meet all of our needs according to your glory, which is in Christ Jesus. We thank you for this time, O oh God. We give you all glory, praise, and honor for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God.